Hey, what is up everybody? This is Stevie Breach coming to you here. Uh, last night I was able to come home and watch the JBL Legend Show on the WWE Network as a part of Undertaker Week. He had a huge stacked guest list of Stone Cold Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels, and Triple H. Um, this is a part of Undertaker Week. They were talking all about Undertaker. I thought it was a very good show. Uh, but at the end of the show, I was, I was upset. I actually took this pen and I threw it across the room because of the fact that I thought it was going to be an hour-long show, and I didn't want it to end because of how good it was and how, um, mainly because there was three guests and JBL talking, it was so jumbled together that um, we didn't get as much out of there. If they wanted to talk about um, you know Undertaker and have it be Undertaker Week, JBL should have done a show with Sean, he should have done a show with Triple H, and he should have done a, Sean, a show with Shawn Michaels, uh, talking all about... Um, all of the, the moments that they shared going on the road because because there's three guys all telling stories and all telling stories about the same thing. When you really break it down, you really didn't get that much from each guy that's there. It's almost like they were wasted having all three of these mega guests on the show at one time. But uh, the show ended, and I honestly thought we weren't going to get part two until after SmackDown on Thursday uh, because that's what they did with the Eric Bischoff uh, interview. They split it into two episodes, and they tried to make it where people would go after Raw and after SmackDown, and it makes sense. Uh, but this morning, I, I went to my comments on my video that I put up last night with my uh, review of the show, talking about everything that went down. Um, and somebody said that, hey, uh, either they messed up or one thing leads to another. Part two is already up on the WWE Network in the on-demand section. So today, after dropping the kids off at work, or I guess, they, uh, hey man, I, they can go out and make a buck and let them go do it. But uh, they went out to, to school. I came home. I flipped it on, and boom, there it was. I started watching it. It was a, it was a good episode. Um, this one talked uh, a lot about uh, you know ribs on Undertaker on him on the road uh, portraying this character twenty four seven whenever I needed. Uh, we talked about you know his backstage leadership role, and they talked about the fact of um, what is going to come the day that Undertaker doesn't wrestle anymore. What, you know, is, you know, when, when is that day going to come? And, and what does that mean for the WWE? Um, you know, Undertaker was a guy that once he took this, a uh, gimmick in 1990, you know, they talked about in the first part that, you know, a thousand guys could have portrayed this character and nobody would have been able to make this work. This was something that the guys uh, all thought was a great, um, you know, gimmick. Uh, but when it all came down to it, they didn't think this gimmick was going to have a whole lot of uh, legs to it. They thought that it was going to have a one year, maybe two year shelf. And then Undertaker would have to be repackaged or sent somewhere else because, you know, how much stuff are you really going to be able to do with a dead man? And here we are 25 years later. But, uh, you know, Undertaker was one of these guys that really took his character and really took it seriously. Um, when he got it into the ring, he never broke. And that was one of the games that Shawn Michaels, Triple H, and uh, Steve Austin would all take with him, was trying to get this guy to break. Um, you know, just um, He just would always play to it. Um and they talk about the fact of, you know, um, they would, they went to Kuwait and they were wrestling on these Kuwaiti shows um, and uh, everybody's having a brawl outside of the ring and everybody's trying to fight, fight, fight. And there comes to a point where Un uh, Undertaker gets hit by Stone Cold Steve Austin and Undertaker does the hair flip. And when he did the hair flip and he came up with the eyes rolled back, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin didn't know what to do. He said he probably was hung over and just not really into what was going on. And he just laughed in Undertaker's face and that made Undertaker break and that's the only time that Stone Cold Steve Austin said that he's ever been able to do it. There's uh, been talks of um, they show it on the uh, Raw after the show um, where they just showed backstage or not backstage but in the ring moments of after the show ended but you know trying to you know send the crowd home with something special that they don't get to see on TV and uh, they had Booker T and they had uh, you know uh, Vince McMahon trying to get Undertaker to do the Taker Rooney uh, Triple H who was a heel at the time he came down and he was the guy working with Undertaker and uh, you know Undertaker's thinking that Triple H is coming down to you know either you know start a fight or, or get something going to get Undertaker out of the ring where he doesn't have to just walk out on everybody um but uh triple h gets into the ring for portraying a baby face pretty much trying to get taker to do the taker rooney and undertaker just looks at him and just says you too and uh, he really can't believe that uh um, that's something that, 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 that they would all try to get him to break. And one thing leads to another. They end up chasing Triple H out of the ring. Vince McMahon looks on like he, he couldn't believe that he wasn't able to get Taker to break. And 
<laughs> it just was something that, you know, these guys are on the road, you know, for, you know, two months straight or however long it's going to be. And if it's something as small as trying to get Undertaker to break into the ring to, to get them, you know, to get in the car and drive to the next town and get the next show going, you know, it, it's something that everybody was trying to do. JBL talks about how he used to close out SmackDown shows as the champion. And it was like a a whole company-wide thing, trying to get Undertaker to break, where everybody was feeding him jokes uh, to give to Undertaker before he would, you know, take the the last ride in the tombstone and uh, try and get him to break. And JBL says that he was never able to do it. Um, <coughs> they tell the story about Undertaker uh, being backstage and just having a bad day, and he needed somewhere to go and 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 basically lay down and take a nap, and nobody was gonna fuck with him, so he went. And he actually laid in one of his coffins. And, uh, you know, basically, you know, as they got closer to showtime, uh, Undertaker was getting out of the casket. And there was people that had gathered around. They didn't say if it was workers or if it was, you know, you know, marks or if it was just backstage personnel people. But they said that Undertaker just sat up in the coffin just like he does in the ring, got out of the coffin and just walked off as if nothing happened, as, as if it was an everyday occurrence that the Undertaker took naps uh, in, his, in his coffin. They talked about, you know, basically... Um, because of him being a leader in the backstage, he didn't want to take any time off. Uh, they talk about the fact that uh, in the early 90s, when Undertaker wrestled with the, the purple mask on his face, it was because he had broken an eye socket, and uh, he didn't want to take any time off. He wanted to work through any injury that he had. They talk about in 2010, he, him breaking his eye socket uh, once again, but still being able to go out there and wrestle. Um, at the Elimination Chamber in 2010, there was a problem with the pyrotechnics, and as Undertaker was coming out for the... Uh, uh, elimination Chamber match itself, um, the pyro went off as as Undertaker was standing in it, and he just suffered all of these burns. Um, you can sort of see this if you go back and watch this on the documentary. They they try their best to edit the most of it out, but uh, you can see uh, Undertaker trying to put out the flames on his jacket as he's making his way down to the ring, but he still gets into the, the chamber, and you can see the spots where he's burned, uh, and he played such a pivotal part of... Um, that chamber match that he had to do it. He had to be a part of it. There was no way to save this and let's do it on Monday Night Raw or do it on SmackDown. He had to be in that chamber and he had to wrestle all the way to the end in order for, you know, Shawn Michaels to come out from underneath uh, and for Shawn Michaels to cost Undertaker the championship to set up uh, the rematch uh, for, for WrestleMania 26. Um, and, and there's not many other guys that are going to take burns like that. I mean, Triple H uh, came out and the dry ice burned him for WrestleMania 29. You can look at Brock Lesnar looking at him like, what the fuck is going on as he gets into the ring and you can see that you know Triple H's abdomen is just completely tore up he's trying to dump water on top of it to stop the burning thing which you can tell it just probably made it burn uh 10 times more um you know, in in the backstage, you know, Taker was the the backstage guy. He was also one of the smartest guys. Uh, Triple H tells the story on his uh, Triple H uh, Thy Kingdom Come DVD of you know, basically when him and Stephanie were trying to heat up and they were becoming a real item. Uh, Triple H pulls Taker aside. They have lunch uh, in a hotel, uh, you know, restaurant. He said it was probably a Fridays or something like that. And he basically laid it out. This is what's going on. What do you think is going to happen? And and you know, Undertaker. <laughs> Told, didn't tell him, you know, you'll go get him, you know, it's a girl, you know, if, if you love her, you know, whatever. Basically put it out there on the table the way it really is. I mean, you're messing with the boss's daughter. If anything goes wrong in this and you guys, you know, don't see eye to eye and you break up, there's going to come, you know, where Vince has to choose his daughter or he's going to have to choose you and he's going to choose Stephanie. You're probably going to lose your job. You're probably going to lose your spot. And uh, as of at that time, you know, there was nowhere else for him to go. There was no WCW. There was no ECW. Um, if it was at the right time period, there's no even, you know, TNA. Um, so, you know, he was risking everything. And, you know, Triple H and Stephanie still ended up going through with it and uh, thinking that, you know, they had the right thing to, to do. Um uh, Taker and Vince had a meeting the next day in Ottawa after the Montreal screw job, uh, where basically Taker left Montreal. He showed up to Monday Night Raw the next week, and he was the guy that went into the room uh, for the boys and talked to um, talked to uh, him first. Um, Shawn Michaels says that he went into the building to, to talk to uh, to talk to Vince that day, and everybody told him to stop. You know, Taker was in the meeting with him already, so Shawn hung out in the hallway and he waited for Taker to come out. Taker immediately walked right up to Shawn, shook his hand, and basically. 
basically said, you know, hey, we got no heat here. You know, you did what you had to do, and that was it. Taker went walking off down the hall. Sean's never asked Vince. He's never asked Taker about what was said in that room. Uh, Triple H says he's not 100% sure, but basically thinks that Vince just laid it out on the table. Just told him what Brent's, uh, what, what Brett wanted to do, what, what Vince wanted to do. Vince had to make sure that at Survivor Series there was a new champion because he didn't want uh, Brett to go to WCW, who he was already under contract with, with the championship belt and be able to you know hurt the company. Um, so you know he was the guy who became the locker room leader, even though there were problems along the way. Um, they talk about El Gigante at WrestleMania Nine, uh, where they made a bet that you know no none of them were well Sean was in the company but Sean didn't speak up but Stone Cold Steve Austin and Triple H neither were with the company at the time neither of them thought that you know Undertaker was complaining in the locker room about having to wrestle this guy he just went out there he tried to find to make a way uh, a way to make it work and they just went on from there um they, they talked about the fact of wrestlers court this is something as wrestling fans we've never been able to see the inside of this we've we've heard about it in a lot of shoot interviews and we try to picture um what's going on with undertaker being the judge um you've got um the godfather as the bailiff uh, you've got uh, JBL as the defense attorney. Um, I'm not sure who the prosecutor is, but um, everybody's trying to uh, you know put a case on somebody. And uh, this was something that brought people together. It was about you know um, trying to show the young guys what it took to be a wrestler in the ring, out of the ring, um, in the in the public's eye. I mean, like uh, they talk about the fact of Teddy Long being too cheap. Um, I don't know if this means he's not, you know, tipping people at the airport or, you know, things that he's supposed to do. Um, but, you know, because of the fact that the uh, the APA put Teddy Long on the stand, um, you know, this was this had younger guys that were in the locker room seeing what it took to be a wrestler 24 um, seven. They told a story that I'd never heard of before, basically about wrestling over in Europe at Insurrection, uh, where Stone Cold Steve Austin came down and his knee brace caught the Undertaker's ear and actually sort of ripped it off, like Mick Foley's ear. Um, and basically, because there was a uh, ordinance in England, uh, I think they called it a um, like a uh, uh, damn uh, a curfew. Um, you couldn't leave. So basically, um, Triple H, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Undertaker, who wrestled in the three-way main event, they basically just had to, you know, shower in the sink real fast, throw some clothes on, and jump into the uh, uh, the airplane. Um, Undertaker, who had his ear ripped off, actually had to have a plastic surgeon meet him uh, at the airport and get on the airplane with him and actually put the ear back onto his head during the flight where he was coming in and out of consciousness. And as he came out of consciousness at one point, uh, Kurt Angle and Vince McMahon were wrestling around. This is when they fly those big jumbo jets because they have to have room for the ring and everything inside of there. Um, sees that Vince and, and Angle are over there just messing around. Uh, he comes over and just puts a hold on Angle. Angle drops. He knocks him out, uh, <coughs> and uh, it's on from there. Um, they talk about the fact that the streak ending at WrestleMania 30. Um, Undertaker says that he doesn't remember anything from 3.30 in the afternoon until 4.30 in the morning the next day. So cool, Steve Austin says that's great because he talked to Undertaker right before he walked out to the ring and he gave him a shameless plug about trying to, to get him to do the podcast. Undertaker said that he would do it, but he hasn't done it to this point. Uh, here we are almost two years later down the road and uh, we're still waiting for that. But uh, uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin seems sort of uh, embarrassed by this at one point. Stone Cold said that he had a beer in each hand. He was watching in the production truck. Um, Shawn Michaels says that he was watching it with Triple H. Uh, nobody knew what was going to happen. Everybody was shocked. Um, people said that there was you know, no way in the world that Taker would ever lose at WrestleMania, and it, it really happened. Uh, Triple H says at WrestleMania 17, when they were you know, you know, laying out their match, no one ever had talk of what the streak was. They just knew that Taker was always going to win at WrestleMania. I think it was a, a WrestleMania 18 after uh, Taker beat Flair. I think he held up 10 fingers, symbolizing that was 10 wins in a row at WrestleMania. Um, I don't know what's going to ever happen when, when Undertaker retires, but I would want it to be, be something like the end of the Poltergeist, where just the house blows up. I, I, I don't want any thought of Undertaker ever coming back. I just want us to all to know. I don't want him to say it. I want it to happen. I don't know if he, he dies or he gets sent up to the top of the arena, much like you know the Royal Rumble back in the day after he lost to Yokozuna, but uh, it's going to be a sad day. This was fun. I want to see more of the Legends with JBLs, but I wanted to be solo shows with just one one guy.